Welcome to our 4 p.m. press event. This is a media availability with Associate Administrator for the Science Mission Directorate, John Grunsfeld of NASA. He'll uh, speak for a few minutes and then we'll open the floor to questions. Okay, welcome. Uh, very exciting day for us uh, at NASA and I think in the planetary science community as well. I can't hear. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> it's for the sound guy. Thanks. Sorry about that. Is that better? All right. Uh, very exciting day for NASA. Very exciting day for uh, planetary science. We uh, were able to make an announcement today, and I'll, I'll run through the, uh, the lineup uh, quickly for those of you who weren't here. First of all, show of hands, not that I can see anything because of the lights, but how many folks were at the NASA town hall? Okay, so about half the folks, so that's good, good information. I'm going to switch to the podium for a moment. Maybe, maybe for the whole time. So at the town hall, uh, we talked about a, a wide variety of subjects, but specifically on Mars exploration. Uh, we talked about uh, the current operational missions that we have and really the tremendous uh, response that we got from uh, the general public, but also the science community about the successful landing of Curiosity. Um, one of the things I said, and, and I, it's a story I'm sticking to, is that uh, truly the earth-shaking news from Curiosity is that it all works. I, I mean, I think it's just amazing, uh, first of all, that we were able to send you know, such a craft to Mars, uh, that the seven minutes of terror uh, resulting in a relatively soft landing uh, worked, and that we've checked out all the instruments, uh, and they're all working. You know, we still have the drill to go, um, but I'm confident that will work as well, uh, and that we have a fully functioning uh, analytical science laboratory on the surface of Mars. Uh, with the kind of complexity that's in you know, all of the instruments, uh, that's no small feat. Um, that takes us you know, really to the end of this uh, decade following uh, you know, the Mars replanning of 2000 uh, that led up to the Mars uh, Science Laboratory. Now there's one more mission that you all know about in 2013, and that's the MAVEN Aronomy mission. Uh, and it's really a crucial partner with the Mars Science Laboratory because the Mars Science Laboratory is giving us the surface science, but you know, one of the key things that we want to learn and that the isotopic analysis of materials in Mars uh, and the atmospherics will help us uh, unravel is, you know, what happened to Mars atmosphere? And so things like this recent deuterium to hydrogen ratio that you saw, a high deuterium to hydrogen ratio compared to Earth, you know, what's actually happening in the upper atmosphere? What are the volatiles doing? How is Mars currently uh, losing atmosphere? And MAVEN will help to unravel that. And that's really the picture of Mars uh, that, that we've had for Mars exploration. And by Mars exploration, I'm talking all of NASA Mars exploration. Uh, this is in the context of uh, not only NASA Mars exploration, but all of these are international missions as well. Uh, so what my job today was to do uh, on behalf of NASA was to fill in the blanks leading through the end of uh, this decade and into the next decade. And so the first element of that actually isn't news, but it's the InSight uh, mission. This was competed under the Discovery Program. And if we have uh, questions related to many things, I'm going to direct them to Jim Green, who's in the front row, who's uh, our director for the Planetary Division and the Science Mission Directorate. And InSight was competitively selected uh, and we announced that uh, just a couple of months ago, and it's a single station geophysical monitoring uh, station for Mars. So it has a, a seismometer and it has a heat flow experiment. It's actually going to stick a probe into uh, the surface of Mars. And it's also going to measure the, orb the rotation characteristics to get to the core of Mars, you know, to understand what's happening uh, inside of Mars. Everything we've done so far, as tremendous as it's been, has been uh, remote sensing and surface science. Uh, InSight, even though it lands on the surface, much like the Phoenix, uh, will actually be able to tell us much about the interior structure. That's how we do it on Earth. In the decadal survey and the discovery section, it was uh, listed as one of the science topics that NASA should, uh, should evaluate, and it was evaluated in, and it won in, in the discovery program. Uh, because it's a Mars mission, it's now part of our Mars exploration. Uh, if you look at the chart, though, there's still you know, a lot of blank space. And 
the future always has a lot of blank space until you fill it in. So I'm going to start filling it in. In 2016, an ESA-led mission, you've probably read a lot about this if you've been following Mars, the ExoMars mission. This is ESA-led with a major partnership from the Russian Space Agency, and uh, you know they're a new partner in this. And we're going to provide the uh, UHF comm system, uh, Electra, for that mission. Uh, and one of the things at Mars that's crucially important is the comm system to be able to communicate uh, from the deep space network and the European deep space network and Earth, and then from the orbit of Mars down to the surface. Uh, all of the data we're getting from the Mars Science Laboratory, Curiosity, comes up through orbital relays through Odyssey and Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, so as participants in that ESA-led mission, uh, we will join with the science teams as well. So we're going to share in the science data. That's the ESA trace gas orbiter. The Russians and the Europeans are providing the instruments. And there will also be an entry, descent, and landing experiment uh, on that mission. And we'll provide help and engineering uh, as best as we can for that mission. We've offered that up. Uh, the details of that are still to be negotiated. The next step for us is to start working on the memorandum of understanding and the official agreements uh, to allow us to go forward with that. Um, but we're going forward with that. The next big step is 2018. Uh, again, this is an ESA-led mission. This is the ESA ExoMars mission. Uh, in, the, um, in the budget buckets of ESA, these ExoMars missions are not in their science portfolio. They're in their exploration portfolio. These two missions are actually part of their exploration effort. Uh, and they're going to do science because uh, when we go explore, that's, uh, that's the important thing to do. Um, but it's interesting to note that at NASA, we have different different buckets, and so I'm representing the science piece. Um, but as you've heard, in the bigger context, NASA has been challenged, and it's been part of, I think, the, the lure of space flight, uh, you know, since before the days of Von Braun, you know, that humans want to go to Mars. That's the, uh, the great target. And we have a challenge, actually, from uh, the current administration, from President Obama, to send humans around Mars in the 2030s and to land somewhere after that. Uh, he said he wants to be around to see that, and I think we should do that. Uh, so. Uh, we have a Mars exploration program, and they've been partners, uh, for instance, on the Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity. Uh, there were experiments, the RAD experiment that we heard about yesterday in the press conference, the Medley uh, you know, instrumentation. You know, they've been partners in our Mars exploration, and I see that growing. And so in the ESA exploration program, we're providing the science. On ExoMars rover in 2018, uh, we're going to provide the front end uh, the instrumentation for the Mars Organic Molecular Analyzer. This is really the keystone experiment uh, that will ride on the rover. So, and uh, again, this is a participation with ESA and Roscosmos, and, uh, and, and we're a partner by providing this instrumentation, uh, in this case built by the Goddard Space Flight Center and partners. Okay, then the next big news, and this was really the, uh, the, the main event uh, at lunch today, is uh, we're going to uh, initiate uh, work on a Mars 2020 science rover. Uh, this is going to be based on the same architecture as the Mars Science Laboratory. Uh, I'm very excited about this. We're going to uh, build a science definition team to come up with the new science responsive to curiosity uh, and, and the science that we've learned from Mars since the decadal survey. Uh, and we'll have to consider you know, all of those aspects, whether we should, uh, what kind of sample handling, what, you know, what kind of drill, if we core, how we analyze the samples, and whether we cache uh, for a future sample return. And so all of that's been queued up, uh, very excited about it. So this is now looking like quite a robust plan. And you know, I think the fact that we were able to uh, address this uh, announcement to the AGU is significant. You know, we've got lots of budget issues. Uh, the, we're still in a continuing resolution for fiscal year 13. Uh, there are questions of sequestration. The administration is still considering uh, our input to the FY14 budget process. Um, but all of these things that we've shown here fit within the president's budget request for fiscal year 13. We, we say that it's in guide. You know, maybe that's too much of an inside Washington term. But it means that within the current Mars line that the president has proposed, uh, we can do all of these activities. And so. Uh, it's a real sign that the administration, that the folks at the Office of Management and Budget, the folks at Office of Science and Technology Policy, you know, all of those folks have approved uh, this plan going forward. And I think it's a signal uh, that, you know, folks really care. The administration, the Congress, the American public care about Mars exploration. 
Uh, and so we're going to move forward on this pretty rapidly, put together the science definition team. Uh, hopefully we'll have an announcement of opportunity for instruments out in the June-July time frame next summer. Uh, and in the meantime, we'll be looking at, you know, all the components that we have from the Mars Science Laboratory. Uh, when we built MSL Curiosity, you know, as we do for, for many missions that are critical missions, you buy spares. For instance, the MMRTG, the Multi-Mission Radioactive Thermal Isotope Generator, that powers the Curiosity. This is the radioactive plutonium source that generates heat, that converts to electricity, that powers the batteries that drive the rover. In fact, uh, Curiosity is a hybrid. It has batteries and a power source, and it charges the batteries and then drives, and then at night recharges the batteries. Uh, but we have a spare, a flight spare. Well, that will become the prime for the 2020 mission. Uh, and there was an engineering test unit that will try and upgrade to a backup. Uh, there are probably many other spare parts. Um, so we're going to start doing the inventory and start building the actual uh, project plan. And it, it's the availability of the spare parts, but also the people and the engineering uh, that went into building Curiosity that we still have. Uh, the team is currently working on analysis of the entry, descent, and landing data from the Curiosity landing. So this whole team of folks at contractors, at the Jet Propulsion Lab, at Goddard Space Flight Center, all around NASA, Langley Research Center, uh, that team is still together, and we're going to then leverage that uh, to build on the Mars 2020 rover, as well as help uh, ESA on the 16 and 18 opportunities. That's what enables us to do this whole plan uh, within the current budget. So this is the new Mars uh, exploration plan. Uh, we are going to work with the Human Exploration Operations Mission Directorate and the Space Technology uh, Group to come up with what the final configuration of experiments and things that we'll do. Um, but I imagine, uh, you know, as we go forward and in the arrow on the right, future planning is, okay, what does the rest of NASA exploration look like? What does the rest of Mars exploration look like? So that we can fill in those blanks. And uh, hopefully over the next six months to a year, more of those details will, will emerge. So with that, I will sit down and answer your questions. Hi there. Jeff Haynes, Styles, Passport to Knowledge. But for the sake of the two impertinent questions I'm going to ask, I'll say that in the mid-90s, we did something called Live from Mars following Pathfinder. And then in 2003, 2004, we did uh, To Mars with MER. And we took a team of scientists and engineers on the road, including uh, Adam Stelsner. And so my first question is about did NASA consider bringing some of the engineers who did the stunning landing uh, to AGU to talk about it in the press conference leading up to the stunning science that I'm sure is going to be done because the instrumentation is pretty stunning as well. And Earth scientists are interested in the tools that are being used and the innovations that are used. And the second question is Jim Cameron, who did a pretty stunning presentation, just learned that you have made this brilliant decision to send the spares to Mars. And so his question immediately was, are you going to put the 3D camera that was almost built uh, and almost ready uh, with the zoom lens, is that going to be considered for the instrumentation package for the 2020 rovers? But stunningly great decision that you've just made. Well done. Well, thank you very much. It was really, I mean, uh, you know, everybody always says this, but this was a, a big team effort, uh, you know, involving folks in the administration. You know, I have nothing but the kindest things to say about folks uh, in office management, budget and OSTP you know, that, that really spent a lot of time working on this and, and figuring out whether it fits within the grander plan, you know, that, that we haven't seen yet. Uh, it was very interactive and it involved folks in planetary uh, at, at NASA headquarters and the community. This was uh, an outgrowth of the Mars Program Planning Group. You know, we, we queued the question up to the community. Given the, the fiscal uh, situation, you know, what, what is the best plan going forward? What would, you know, what could we do? And, you know, I challenged the team to come up with, to recapture is the word I used, recapture mission in 2018. Why? Just because planetary alignment, that's the most energetically favorable uh, launch date. Um, and so we could have come up with something in 2018, but between, you know, really the, the budget that we're in, you know, we would not have had such a full program. We could have not participated with ESA, uh, and we, we would not have had a rover. It would have been a, a, a downscaled uh, orbiter of some kind. And uh, the action right now is on the surface, and, and that's where we want to be. And so I was, you know, the team convinced me that, that waiting two more years, getting a more capable system, retaining the expertise of, of exploring on the surface uh, was, was well worthwhile. I think there's no question that, w you know, we're going to consider. Uh, I was a big fan of the, I'll just say it this way, I was a big fan of the 3D and the zoom lens, and, uh, you know, we didn't have the opportunity for uh, 
let's see, we didn't have the opportunity for curiosity, um, but I, I am more than happy to engage in the spirited discussion for this next rover uh, to, to include those elements. I, you know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of vicarious exploration, and I think that's what these high-definition views of Mars uh, are giving us now. Um, I have on my iPad uh, a, a 3D panorama that I use quite a lot of curiosity that a, somebody outside of NASA stitched together the early photos, and you can, you can explore the various sites. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, and as you move it around, the uh, accelerometer in the iPad will you know, shift the view, and you can look down on the deck and up at the sky. And uh, you know, it gives me a feeling as if I'm on Mars, and you know, I'd, I'd like to go to Mars. So uh, let's see, there's one other element. Oh, you know, I was just going to mention, I mean, it, it shouldn't uh, be lost that John Grot Grotzinger, the mission scientist, uh, for curiosity is actually an earth scientist and you know, he's written the classic text on on earth science and it you know there's uh, well to quote a, a friend of mine mike massimino who uh four hours in in orbit on his first flight with me in 2002 uh, he floated up to the flight deck and looked out the window and said wow the earth is a planet <laughs> uh you know I, I see a continuum i mean the sun is a star you know the earth is a planet we have planetary science we have earth science um, but those are, um, those are arrangements of convenience. Uh, the real power of a, of a meeting like the American Geophysical Union is we bring together, you know, the, the folks who study heliophysics and the folks who study atmospherics and Earth mm -hmm. and Mars and the, the solar system and the sun. And uh, it's, you know, it's very collaborative and multidisciplinary, and that's where the real breakthroughs come. John Irene Klotz with, with Hi, Reuters. Hi. Um, the 1.5 billion plus or minus the 0.2, does that include a launch vehicle? Yes, that includes the launch vehicle. And uh, I should have clarified, that's that estimate, which was done by the Mars Program Planning Group by Aerospace Corporation, uh, assumed FY15 dollars. They just had to pin it somewhere. Okay. So those Thanks. are FY15 and, uh, dollars. The, uh, um, you mentioned you'd like to go to Mars, of course, and you come from a unique position, you know, being an astronaut and now doing space science. but. Um, could you maybe just, and I, I know this is all in announcement of opportunities forthcoming, but could you maybe just flesh out a little bit about what you personally, professionally would like to see to unite some of the human, um, like the, the laying the groundwork for human missions that you mentioned at the town hall meeting with, uh, with this rover? Thanks. Well, I think we've already gotten a little bit of a taste from the curiosity results, and one of the big ones uh, that was, I think it's big, it was uh, yesterday was well. There are two things. One one is the rad results. Um, you know we're very afraid of space radiation. You know for good reason, especially the galactic cosmic rays. Well, we actually sent uh, an instrument, the rad instrument, uh, with inside of the uh, protective back shell with the heat shield with the rover around it uh, that they were able to analyze as a tissue equivalent dose, as if there was a person in there. So they did the math to translate the radiation that they saw. Uh, and now we have it on the surface. And that's starting to give us the information uh, that the life sciences teams will be able to use uh, to assess you know, what are the hazards. Now, if there's a big solar particle event uh, of some kind, or you know, coronal mass ejection, solar flare, uh, that could be an immediate risk to a future crew and we'll have to shield against that. But the galactic cosmic rays is a, is a constant, you know, the, well, it modulate by the solar cycle, but essentially a constant threat that we have to really learn about before we risk crews going out there. Um, you know, I'm confident we'll get through that. Um, you know, the, the, a mission to Mars is going to be hugely risky no matter what. And so we have to assess what level is that risk against others. But until we have data, until we make measurements, it's an unknown. So that we've made a first step there. Uh, the other is that the scale of the heat shield uh, for this Mars Science Laboratory system is on the scale of what you might have for a human system. It's comparable to the Orion heat shield. Um, not that Orion necessarily will go into the atmosphere of Mars, but we're starting to learn about things at scale. So looking down the road, uh, you know, there's a whole list of topics, uh, both in technology, for instance, precision landing. You know, you would like future crews to be able to say, you know, I'm going to land right next to you know, or within, you know, a very short distance of, you know, the cargo ship that I landed previously. Okay, well, you know, if you're many kilometers away, you know, that's not right next to. You want to land meters away. And so uh, some of the things that Space Technology Program is looking at would advance us towards that. Uh, examples are entry, descent, and landing systems, or even s simple things. 
uh, you know, the big breakthrough in navigation on the surface of the Earth was a better clock. Well, the same thing is true in space, and so we've looked at an atomic clock that would be small enough to fit to allow us to, to precisely time the entry into the Mars atmosphere uh, and to be able to navigate to know uh, what that will be so that our active guidance system, which was a uh, brand new feature on, on MSL, can then navigate you uh, and guide you to a, to a precision landing. Very successful on, uh, on the Mars Science Laboratory. Um, down the road, be well beyond this time frame in that future planning, there are things that I would you know, love for us to start queuing up, one of which is in situ resource utilization. You know, how do we use the things we're learning about on Mars? One of the other exciting things, Vikings saw it, but we got confirmation uh, with the SAM results is that there's you know, a fair amount of nitrogen in the Mars atmosphere. Uh, well, nitrogen is something that is very important for humans. You know, we live in an oxygen-nitrogen atmosphere. Uh, without that on Mars, we might have to take it with us. Uh, and so that's, that's a, a resource we can use. Of course, you know, water vapor or water in, in, the, in the surface, uh, we saw high water content. We could heat that out and use the water. Better if we land near ice, and there's a lot of ice on Mars. Uh, so a lot, a lot of neat stuff to start looking at the future. And so if we think of the 2030s as the potential for human exploration, I think this 2020 rover and the other things we might be able to do in the 2020s uh, as a synergistic collaboration between science and human space flight, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, cool things we can do you know, that will advance us, both in the science and for exploration. I don't know, anything else, Jim? Uh, this is yeah. a very exciting uh, mission, but I do have to ask, what about the icy moon people? They've, uh, uh, they didn't get the Titan Mare Explorer, and now uh, you said this comes out of the science budget. It's another big project for Mars. Uh, do they have anything to look forward to? Well, I, I would be, Surprised if we don't see the Titan Mary, Ex Mary Explorer reproposed. Um, you know that. You know all of the missions that were under consideration: the Comet Hopper, the Titan Mary Explorer, and, and Insight. You know were exciting missions. Um, the real challenge is it's very hard uh, to go out to these icy moons. Um, it's still a, a really interesting target. What we were solving here is under the current Mars budget. You know what can we do for Mars? Uh, we're still working very hard on. Uh, icy moon missions. Uh, as a step in that direction, uh, under uh, Jim Green's leadership, we negotiated with the Europeans to be a part of their JUICE mission, which is the Jupiter Icy Moon Ex Explorer. This is a, a large mission for ESA, and, and we will have a significant part of that, and we will share in all the science. Um, we solicited proposals, we've received those proposals, and we're reviewing them, and it will include flybys of Europa. Uh, and we're going to continue to work to do a Europa mission. We've funded a number of studies to try and look at, the, as the Decadal Survey suggested, a descoped mission, and we've come up with some things that are starting to get down into the price range that we might be able to request a new start. But it's going to take a, uh, you know, a new start to a program to be able to do a mission like that. Uh, you know, a Mars mission we're able to do in the category of a New Frontiers type budget, uh, that's not the case yet for, uh, for a Europa or a uh, you know, an Enceladus or other type of uh, icy moon mission. These, they're still in the what you know are called flagship mission uh, classes. But in the meantime, we're investing heavily in developing the instruments and the technology to enable us to do a mission. You know, sometime in in a decade or so. And that's really crucial. That the success of Curiosity. You know, we think of as you know the sky crane and the landing system. But as much a success as the landing technology is the investments we made over the decade in the instruments and getting SAM from you know, something that wouldn't fit on this table down to a microwave. Uh, and the same for ChemM and, and the other instruments. You know, really remarkable. Uh, and I think for this Mars 2020, we'll see that the investments we've continued in the research and technology program will give us you know, new instruments like Raman and others that uh, enable you know, new science to be done. And that's, that's the neat work of the science definition team is to put that together. This is a question from Alan Boyle at NBC News, uh, who's watching on the internet. Uh, my question is about spare parts. Is using actual spare parts, for example, uh, from the engineering model, part of the plan? And another big question is, um, are you hearing from the scientists, this is a bit of a repeat, but are you hearing from the scientists who are really, really worried about other planetary missions in light of the rover announcement? And what are you saying to them? So I, I think. Where there were flight qualified spares, you know, that's exactly the idea. And we know that there's some subset of parts that have 
flight backups or flight qualified spares. And that's normal in a project to have that uh, because if there's an item like an actuator uh, that has a you know, two year lead time and you have lots of actuators, you buy spares and flight qualify them so that if during integration and test they fail, you have something to put in. And so now that we've been able to publicly announce this, uh, you know, JPL can start going through their, their spares closet and identifying all those things. But it's not just the spares that we want to start getting uh, a look at. I mean, I'm, I think I mentioned the MMRTG as one. Uh, you know, that's a very expensive item and that we do know that we have a flight spare and a back and an engineering test unit. We don't know yet whether we can upgrade the engineering test unit to a flight unit, um, but I think that would be highly desirable. Uh, so that's one area we're looking. But also there's some components where you know, it took a decade to build Mars Science Laboratory. There's almost certainly some components that were made by a subcontractor where the subcontractor has been bought out or gone out of business or in a different business line or doesn't make the part anymore. Those are uh, parts obsolescence. So we need to identify those so that we can start working on replacements for those now. Uh, and you know, a lot of early work to do to try and make sure that we can do this at the lowest post cost possible. Um, you know, this really addresses the Mars science in our Mars project line. We also have, uh, you know, research in outer planets work. And, you know, yes, we're very concerned about balance and we're very concerned about, you know, addressing all of the scientific priorities. Uh, in a fiscally constrained budget, there's a limit to what you can do. Uh, you know, Mars does have a special place, though, in that it's an opportunity where we can have early synergy between the human spaceflight and uh, exploration and science opportunities to go explore Mars. Uh, you know, the su really successful landing of Curiosity, which was the engineering event, as we've seen here at AGU, is being followed up by really interesting science. Uh, as I said uh, earlier to, uh, at, at the town hall, you know, I think the earth-shaking news out of Curiosity is that we landed successfully and that all the instruments are working. That's no, no, uh, no small feat uh, to do tens of millions of miles away from Earth. Uh, where you know you're not in control. I mean, the the flight computer was in control. Uh, you know, a whole series of improbable events worked correctly, and I find that very exciting. Uh, but I can guarantee there will be some uh, discoveries that everybody will agree is earth shaking down the road. Um, I have another question from Pete Spots from the Christian Science Monitor. Does this seek to retain the alternating rover lander pattern lander pattern of the previous? incarnation of the program? Or does this aim to steer toward the more direct sample return path in the MPPG's options? The critical thing is that you have orbital comm assets to get data back and that you also have critical orbital assets to do reconnaissance of sites. Uh, you know, we, with the uh, high-rise instrument, which is the high resolution camera on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, we've only sampled a few percent. We've only studied a few percent of the surface of Mars at the, at the 30 centimeter -ish resolution uh, that we used to land Curiosity. And so there's a lot of Mars that I consider still unexplored territory. Um, so as part of this plan, we are going to extend uh, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter operating lifetime as far as funding. So we've included that uh, within guide in the budget. Also, Curiosity. Curiosity has a nominal two-year mission. Um, we've already decided with, with this plan that we will continue to operate Curiosity as long as it's scientifically viable. Uh, and, you know, that could be a long time. You know, it's got a lot of power in that uh, MMRTG. So, uh, so there's, there's no specific plan to alternate orbital and landers. It's really what's the highest priority science and what can we do to expand our, uh, our exploration objectives. And right now we, we believe that we will have the communication assets with MAVEN turning into a communication satellite after its mission is done, with the uh, ESA 2016 TGO and the communication uh, we're equipment we're providing, and the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter in an extended lifetime. I don't think Odyssey will probably be alive still in 2020 because you know, we're, we're continually working, you know, reaction wheel issues and things like that. Uh, but you never know. If it is, we'll keep, we'll keep it going because uh, getting the data back uh, is that important. And it's, all of these missions have been just phenomenal. So there's no deliberate plan to alternate. It's really about infrastructure and science. Science first, infrastructure next. Uh, I'm Harvey Leifert, freelance. 
Ah, okay. Thanks. Hello. Uh, I have a two-part question. Uh, the first is, wouldn't you hope that by 2020, uh, NASA could develop a less terrorful descent method for the, uh, for the new rover? And perhaps related to that, uh, going out toward uh, human exploration, I think you said the first uh, goal would be to circle Mars but not land on it. Um, if I heard that correctly, I'm wondering why going to the risk and expense of sending people so far away, you wouldn't just take the next step and land, uh, assuming you had a good landing method. I know that's what we did with the moon, but this is many, many decades later. Yep. Well, I think the key, let me answer the second one first. Uh, the key to uh, going to Mars is not a successful entry and landing. It's launching off the surface and coming home. Um, but, you know, the, the 2030 goal of sending humans around the world, uh, around the moon, <coughs> around Mars, is, uh, it's been a long day. Um, you know, 20 years from now, that's not that far away, given our state of technology. You know, so you look at the elements. We're building a space launch system in Orion, using ISS. Uh, you know, those are going to take some time. The first flight with uh, humans aboard on, on uh, SLS is 2021. Uh, the, the probability that in the next 10 years we would develop all of the systems of uh, crew habitation on the surface, descent, and an ascent module and a system and in-situ resource utilization uh, in a reasonable budget, meaning roughly the budget we have now, I think is highly improbable. But it's not improbable that we could do the round trip. And so, you know, the question is why would we do that? Because that's the f a first step uh, in exploring the red planet. Uh, if we can do that and bring a crew back safely, you know, then we can go the next step and, you know, and build up slowly. You know, would I prefer that we have the budget to go and do the whole thing at once and land on the first mission? Uh, yeah, I think that would be preferable. You know, th then we'd have geologists and astrobiologists on the surface sooner uh, and, and get to the, the really tough places. Humans are really good at going to tough places. Uh, but, I, you know, I th we're, we're trying to develop what, what is a measured plan. Uh, now, technology may change that. You know, unforeseen circumstances may change that. But, you know, the, the difference is that in the Apollo era, we had a timetable, uh, we had a budget, and we had a social imperative to achieve that goal. Uh, and, and, you know, absent something like that, which I think is unlikely for Mars, you know, now we're doing it for all the right reasons, which is science. At least that's my story. Uh, oh, with the landing system. Well, you know, the, when you asked that question, I was thinking, you know, people think of the shuttle as, uh, space shuttle launches now as routine. And what that means is they don't really understand it. Uh, you know, it's eight and a half minutes to orbit uh, with the space shuttle. And, you know, when you climb on the rocket and there's four and a half million pounds of explosive fuel under you and you feel the power of all of that, you know, it's eight and a half minutes of terror. But most astronauts, at least, you know, I can speak for myself and, and the people I've flown with, you know, it's not terrifying. Uh, because, you know, one, we've signed up for it, and two, you know, we have some understanding of it. And so I think sending curiosity on its voyage the first time, you know, was terror. The second time, it'll be apprehension, you know, and if we can, you know, use this as a model and build on it, each time we'll get slightly more comfortable. But there were a lot of unknowns, the Mars atmosphere, the presence of dust storms, you know, the, the temperature density, uh, the time, you know, all of these things, you know, small variances could have, you know, resulted in a disaster. Um, and folks worked really hard to understand all of the elements and put them in place. Um, but if you look at the history of Mars exploration, you know, it's slightly less than 50-50 success ratio. And so, you know, that I think generated some of the terror. And, uh, you know, we're, we're incredibly excited that it worked and now the great science is coming out. Uh. Hey, John, it's Adam from, uh, what, my name's Adam Mann from Wired, and um, I guess I'm just wondering about, um, so the number one choice on the planetary decadal was uh, a cacher, and that was something that Steve Squires and, and you both mentioned at, uh, during the town hall meeting. Um, so if that is something that goes up, I guess, does that commit NASA then to sample return for the next decade after that? Um, and then also just as a somewhat uh, related question is uh, this new rover 
also maybe going to land at one of the other landing spots that MSL didn't go down to? Okay, so let me answer the second pattern, answer the second question first because it's easier. Uh, actually, by you know, the, the 2011 launch frame and a 2012 landing is not one of those favorable alignments of the planets where the minimum energy transfer occurs. Uh, it was energetically less favorable than it will be in 18 or 20. And so in 2020, we actually have access to more of Mars uh, than we had available to us landing in 2012. Um, and so we would land in 2021. And that opens up, you know, areas of Mars that are at higher elevations uh, and, and places that, you know, we would have loved to have sent Curiosity, but we couldn't. And so that'll be part of this science definition team is to start looking at, you know, given what we've learned from Curiosity, given what we learned from the landing site selection, I think there were five landing sites, you know, that, that sort of became prime from which we selected Gale Crater. Uh, and Gale Crater is actually below sort of mean surface level on Mars, and that's higher atmospheric density and, you know, helped us with the precision landing. Uh, so we'll be able to hopefully target, you know, more interesting places than even Gale Crater. And Gale Crater is already pretty interesting given that we landed in an ancient riverbed. So uh, that's work to go forward. Also, by, by landing the MSL system and Curiosity, we've learned more about the parachute performance, the heat shield, the guided entry, and so hopefully we can tune that up and the sky crane, and we can tune those up to maybe even have more precise landing. And so that may open up even further more interesting places. You know, typically in, in, uh, in Earth exploration and geology, the most interesting places are also the hardest to get into. Uh, and, and so that, that's true on Mars as well, I'm sure. Uh, the, uh, the question of caching is gonna be a trade-off case. Uh, and by that I mean the science definition team is gonna have to weigh you know, what science do we want to get done? How much mass and power do we have available? What can we get to the surface and where do we want to go? Um, the decadal survey said the highest priority is caching for some unspecified future sample return. Uh, you know, we want caching to be in the discussion space, but the team, you know, the team that's put together working with the, the full community may decide uh, that they want caching, they may decide that they would rather use that weight and volume for additional in situ science to go to some really interesting place uh, that would emerge from what we discover, you know, in the next six months uh, to eight months on, on Curiosity. Uh, so all of that's open. Uh, there's no question, though, that it's a priority for me, and we will front load the charter for the science definition team to look at caching, but more importantly, to look at sample acquisition and characterization. So, for instance, we have a drill on Curiosity, but we don't have something to, to take a core of a rock or a core into the surface, and that's something that was prioritized very high. So, you know, if we have a robotic arm and on the end, you know, we, we need to have some additional tools, the things that any reasonable geologist would carry, you know, out to a field site today. Uh, and so the sample handling and acquisition is, is a step towards sample return, and then the question on the table will be, you know, the mass and volume to hold, you know, a sample container uh, and handler that has uh, cache samples. Now, if we put a cache on it, uh, you know, this is not locking us into a, uh, a sample return mission to follow it right away. Um, and even in the Cato survey, it said in the late 2020s or 2030s, you know, to go find a way to retrieve it. That said, the uh, interesting result, which is, you know, to be expected, but the Mars Program Planning Group looked at it all again and came back with the result that the type of architecture, which is a, a sequenced uh, plan of missions, the, the best architecture for finding synergy between human spaceflight and science is a sample return architecture. And it's pretty simple. If you can send a mission to Mars, acquire a sample, and return that sample back to Earth, that's a good model for sending a human to Mars and returning that Mars, that human to Earth. Uh, and so if, if we hope to be able in the 20, late 2030s or 2040s, you know, send a crew to Mars, have them, you know, explore, find fossils, and bring them back, you know, if that's what they do, uh, you know, it'd be nice to demonstrate that we can do that at subscale uh, prior to that at some time. Dave, Dave, excuse me, David Hirsch, NHK Television. If um, the mandate of curiosity is to search for evidence of, of Mars's habitability, I wonder if can you kind of come up with what the tagline for this rover would be, and if, and if it's not yet done, what would you like that to be? 
Well, I think it, it's a science and exploration rover. Um, you know, our search for, you know, evidence of past habitable environments is in an astrobiology context. Uh, so that's obviously another word that, uh, you know, comes to mind. Um, but, you know, that's the, that's the fun that the science definition team uh, gets to do. Uh, and it kind of depends where, you know, where, you know, what kind of sites, you know, they want to explore. I have another question from the internet. This is from Craig Kovalt from uh, Space Ref Curious Mars. Can you discuss solar power instead of nuclear power as the energy source for this mission as the MPPG raised? And also, while you're talking about energy, um, what is the plutonium-238 supply for the RTG? So the Mars Program Planning Group looked at a solar option uh, for a Mars Science Lab chassis, um, and, and that was you know, just because we already know the answer for an MMRTG powered rover, plutonium powered rover, and so they wanted to kind of look at that as an option. Um, there, there are two parts of that, one of which is in order to fly uh, a radioactive power source on a rocket, we have to get approval, and that's a rather lengthy approval process, uh, and so we're going to get that started right away, uh, 2020 is not that far away, and we will probably also study the solar powered option uh, as, a, as a backup. But if we really want to do this at the lowest p cost possible, which we do, and the highest performance, uh, the, the radioactive thermal generator is still the best option that we have because all of the engineering has been done. If we go to a, you know, one of the, the uh, MMRTG is a heat source, and it provides heat and it provides electricity through the conversion of heat into electricity, thermoelectric. Uh, and so there's a lot of systems engineering uh, that went into the rover system uh, that incorporates all of the heat flow, the energy flow. If we go to solar, we would probably, almost certainly, and I'll, I'll sort of toss this to Jim, but we'd almost certainly still have to find plutonium uh, radioactive heater units to heat critical elements because at night, you know, the batteries would deplete themselves just keeping the rover warm, and we want this to be a long-lived uh, science mission. And so either way, we have to go through that approval process. So I think the most likely endpoint uh, is uh, with these MMRTGs. Now the, the MMRTGs have fuel associated with them that we have in the flight backup uh, and the engineering test unit. We'll have to do an evaluation to see if those fuels are appropriate for use in 2020. Um, but we have a program working with the Department of Energy uh, to re replenish the science plutonium fuels. Uh, and so I wouldn't say I'm not worried about that because we're always worried about it, but it's something that a risk we're managing and working towards uh, in partnership with the Department of Energy. Um, and I have a question from Frank Mooring from Aviation Week and Space Technology. What is the estimated cost of the 2020 mission at this point, and uh, how will NASA coordinate with ESA and others on science planning? The, uh, the estimate for a rover like this from the Mars Program Planning Group uh, and, and we've, you know, somewhat validated that internally, but not a true, uh, what I would say, a true cost estimate. Uh, but Aerospace Corporation did a study for the uh, Mars Program Planning Group that, that we chartered, and the cost was, uh, as I said earlier, $1.5 billion, plus or minus 0.2, including launch vehicles, in FY15 dollars. You know, that's, that was their conclusion. Um, and that was based on knowing that there are parts available, the engineering is here, the expertise is here, the people. And, and it's probably a pretty reasonable estimate. Uh, the cost for MSL Curiosity, uh, had we launched in the original 2009 date and not encountered some technical problems, probably would have been in that ballpark. Um, but we encountered technical problems that we had to solve. Uh, this is before my time, so Jim can give you details of that. But in order then to overcome those technical problems, we had to slip two years. Uh, and you know that increased the cost you know, significantly over the original roughly 1.5 billion. Well, one of the reasons we're going with the same architecture is, okay, we've now retired all of those technical problems and risks. We know the system works. And so there's two aspects to the cost. One is the cost, and then the other is, uh, you know, the belief that the cost, you know, uh, won't grow uh, because of unknown unknowns. Well, we've retired most of the unknown unknowns. And so, we, you know, we, we talk about having reserves or uh, this and that. So on things that we've already built or things that are built, you know, we don't have to carry the same kind of reserves on top of those as, you know, to account for unknowns as we would uh, for things that are first-time builds. 
And so that's a big factor that we think uh, will not only uh, give us the opportunity to build it at a lower cost than we did MSL, significantly lower cost, but also that our prediction on what the cost will be will be more accurate. And we'll actually, you know, now that we're starting, uh, you know, not in the pre-formulation phase, but before we go to, uh, you know, full implementation, we will do a full what's called joint confidence level budget and schedule estimate. And this is a probabilistic cost and schedule assessment. Um, and I think this will probably be one of the best ones we've ever done because we have so much legacy. The really hard things are when it's first of a kind. You know, and people have to make guesses. In this case, we actually have data uh, to support our cost estimates. Um, actually, um, one of, uh, Jonathan Amos, BBC, uh, here, John, and I don't think you answered the, the second part of Frank's oh. question, which I wouldn't get to oh, ask yes. anyway. Um, Thanks. But if I can just add to, to what Frank was saying, because um, I was at the ESA ministerial meeting in Napoli uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it, I mean, it's still not completely there, but the Russians seem to be on board with, uh, with ExxonMars. But really, I'm interested in the conversation that you had with uh, Alvaro Jimenez um, and what you've discussed. Uh, what ESA thinks of this and what they may be able to bring to the party? So, uh, Alvaro Jimenez, my counterpart in ESA, and I have been having discussions actually over many months about future planning, about Mars, about uh, JUICE, you know, all of our programs. Uh, and as I said, the ExoMars program is actually in their exploration program, and so they're organized a little differently. So it's sort of a combination, you know, it's, it's what would be in our Human Exploration Operations Division. And, and so it, there's a, you know, an additional synergy that they're also mixing science and exploration, and we're trying to uh, increase our mixing of science and, and exploration. Uh, so we're very much on the same page, so to speak, that uh, we want to cooperate. Uh, we also recognize uh, that and this has been true in science you know, for as long as you know, I've been involved with NASA science. It's an international effort. And it's just a question of you know, who is leading on what mission. Uh, you know, the Hubble Space Telescope is a joint ESA-NASA mission. Um, and so this is, this is our norm. Uh, and I think what we're seeing uh, in this layout is it's really just a question of who is the lead you know, for a particular mission. And so we spoke. Uh, uh, Dr. Jimenez and I spoke this morning, and, and he thinks this is a, a great development, and he looks forward to the talks where we can figure out, you know, how ESA will participate. Um, but it's not just ESA. We also have individual member states. Uh, when we finish the Mars Program Planning Group activities that, that wrote us letters or calls and said, hey, whatever you come up with, you know, we want to we want to participate. You know, this is a worldwide effort to explore Mars. Uh, Curiosity is an incredibly international rover. Uh, it speaks all languages. And I, I wonder, does it tweet in all languages? Does anybody know? Uh, we should find out. But uh, if it doesn't, it should. Uh, it, should tweet, it should tweet REM in, in Spanish, so uh, the, the weather data. And I know actually there is a, uh, a web page with the REM data that's hosted uh, in Spain where the, where the principal investigator is that's in Spanish because I've gone to that website frequently to see what the weather is on Mars. Um, and so we will be participating, and it will be an inter international mission, as all our missions are. Casey Dreyer from the Planetary Society. Uh, just to clarify, does this mission proposal live uh, in the 2013 budget constraints as written? So, example, it cuts $300 million from the planetary budget and then cuts also the Mars Exploration Program budget within that. Does this assume any changes in the Mars Exploration Program budget, or does this... This fits exactly within, within the future Mars line that's within the President's FY13 budget request without any modification. Now we did, in, in that budget it said future Mars and there was not specificity in what is in that line. So what this does is add specificity to how every dollar will be spent. And then just quickly to follow up on that, Adam Schiff, representative from California today, uh, released a press statement saying that he's going to work to see if he can move this mission up to 2018. Is there any technical reason, if the money was put in, that would prevent that from happening? Or is it only the money that requires this mission to happen in 2020? Actually, I, I think 2020 is ambitious. And a lot of it has to do with the science instrument development. You know, it's seven years. It'll be six years from the release of the funds to build the instruments and do all of the technology. Uh, you know, it might be possible to do it in 2018, but it would be a push. 
uh, and it, what it might do is exclude certain science investigations that otherwise would be possible if they had the extra two years. So that, you know, that's something downstream. But under the, the President's FY13 request, uh, 2020 is, is an aggressive schedule. Um, we're running out of time, so unfortunately this will be the last yeah. question, but this is from Keith Cowing from nasawatch.com. Uh, when will NASA actually... Just tell Keith the answer is yes. <laughs> oh, no, sorry. Go ahead. When will NASA actually try to find evidence of life on Mars? Uh, Viking tried it in 76, but since then NASA has gone out of its way to state that each and every one of its missions cannot actually, quote, detect life, but rather that the hardware can only detect things that might point to the possibility that maybe there might be something that might hint at life, maybe. Well, maybe the answer to that is that we maybe... No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, actually, I, you know, I, I actually side with Keith on this. I think it would be very exciting to send, you know, a new mission to a place where we think there could be, uh, you know, current extant life if there's life on Mars. Um, you know, there are a lot of issues with that having to do with planet, planetary protection and others. Um, but on the original ExoMars proposal, uh, the British actually had some life detection uh, experiments planned. And during the Mars Program Planning Group uh, activity, you know, they volunteered that if we do a lander, you know, they, they would like to contribute that. I don't, you know, I don't, I heard that anecdotally. Um, but, you know, I think all of those things are on the table. Uh, and, you know, in the charter for the, uh, the science definition team, they should evaluate those against the other options. You know, especially with, you know, the decreasing size, power, and, and weight of, uh, of, the, of some of those technologies. Uh, I think that'd be a very exciting thing to do. Okay, so that wraps up this um, media availability. Thank you very much, John Gunsfeld, and all the reporters who came today. Um, our next event is going to be a bloggers forum. Well, thank you, everyone. You're a big part of uh, communicating all this. <laughs>